Well, almost uh, 30 years ago, back in 1995, anybody uh, remember 1995? Before I was called into vocational ministry at a time when Tanny and I were still fairly newly married, uh, a worship song was written and performed by Matt Redman. It came out in that year. It was called Better Is One Day. Some of you remember it, right? You remember Christian Contemporary from the 1990s, right? Here's how the lyrics went. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. I'm not going to sing it, by the way. You would not want that. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. And then it gets a little wonky here. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me and I will draw near to you. So simple melody, lots of repetition, but I vividly remember back in the 1990s loving that song, not just because there were portions of it that came directly out of scripture, But I recall the imagery in my mind as I sang that song. It evoked so many things. When I thought about the dwelling place of Yahweh, what would that look like? I thought about the courts of God's house. And that, of course, uh, being a, a history nerd and someone who likes to do research, took me down a wonderful rabbit hole of studying what the ancient temple in Jerusalem would have been like. But ever since we started, I I first sang that song, I always loved singing it in church. And I could picture in my mind's eye, whenever I sang those lyrics, the glory of the temple. But it also produced some nagging questions for me. And maybe you have some of these same questions. As a Christian, we don't have a temple to worship in anymore, right? So is there a particular place that we can go to where we can say, I've entered into your courts, O Lord, and I found them to be altogether lovely? Are we able to do that as Christ followers? And so I promised myself that someday I would figure all this out and hopefully be able to teach others about it. And to some extent, today is that day, which is exciting. And really in a nutshell, what it comes down to is what we might call sanctuary theology or temple theology. Although it's best sort of uh, lumped under this broad category we know of biblical theology because, because what the psalmist is gonna talk about in the text for today goes all the way across from literally from Genesis to Revelation. And we'll see that today. It's rooted in one simple idea that God repeats many times to his people in many different ways. And this is basically what he says. Boom. Here we go. I will dwell among my people. There it is. I will dwell among my people. We see that all over the scriptures. In many portions and in many ways, God says it over and over again, I desire to dwell among my people. And you see this, this is a very sophisticated chart that I created here. Uh, You see it begin all the way back in the Garden of Eden and then into the tabernacle in the wilderness to the temple in Jerusalem and then to Jesus, the word made flesh and then to the church and now into the future, this idea of the millennial kingdom and ultimately the eternal state. In every one of those stages, we see that God has a desire to dwell with his people. That is the story of God, his love story, his desire to live and to commune with us. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what, what, what will. That a holy God desires to dwell and to commune with people like us. That he would condescend to do that is an amazing thing. And so in today's text, we're going to study the the third stage that you see there on the screen, the loveliness of Yahweh's dwelling place in Jerusalem. But more than that, we're going to look at how that picture in the Psalms then connects with all the other stages. So grand vision for the message this morning, and I hope you'll be able to track with me. So grab your Bibles. I'll come back to that. We're going to go to Psalm 84. Some of you knew this was coming, so you have your Bibles open, right? Nice. Psalm 84. Now, last week we studied a psalm written by a storied musician from the days of David and Solomon. Do you remember his name? Asaph. And today we're looking at a psalm that is written by contemporaries of Asaph, a group of men collectively known as the sons of Korah. 
And as you get to Psalm 84, you see that there is a superscription at the top that reads, for the choir director on the getith, which we really don't know what that is. Some kind of musical instrument, probably a stringed instrument, but we don't know for sure. And then it says, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Now, the sons of Korah wrote 11 of the 150 psalms. This is, I believe, the fourth one of theirs that we have uh, covered. So I won't go back through all the history. We just need to know that the sons of Korah were prominent Levites. They were descended from a well-known family who'd been given care and responsibility for the sanctuary of the Lord. They were basically custodians of the, of the tabernacle and then the temple later under Solomon, custodians of God's house. So responsible for the chambers and the furnishings, the gates and the doors. And there's good reason to believe that Psalm 84 was written after the life of David and during the initial years of Solomon's reign after the construction of the temple was completed. So what I want to do this morning is walk through some of the key verses in this psalm and we'll do some sort of translation comparisons along the way. And then we'll try to make connections to that main theme, which is that God desires to dwell among his people. Okay, look at verse one. We're gonna begin with this well-known phrase that again was captured in that, that worship song from 30 years ago. Verse one, how lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. Now, the Hebrew word there for lovely is yadid and is poetic and lovely as that sounds. Most Hebrew scholars will tell you that that's probably not the, the most accurate translation. That really what it should read is how beloved are your dwelling places, O Lord. Or if I would paraphrase it according to the Jeff No Study Bible, how much I love every part of your magnificent house, O Lord. That's what he's saying. How I love, how I long for every part of your magnificent house. Now, one of the things you find interesting in this psalm is that how the psalmist refers to God throughout this particular song. Four times he calls him what? The Lord of hosts in English. The Lord of hosts. In Hebrew, you guys know probably this is Yahweh Sabaoth. And that, and that, that title, Saba, comes, is, the, is the Hebrew word for army. So there's a very specific vision that the psalmist has of God. He is, he is the God of the heavenly armies. And so the picture you get is the psalmist is thinking of the temple, this grand temple in Jerusalem. And as he looks at it, this is what he thinks of, the God or Yahweh of armies, which speaks of his might and his power. It talks about Yahweh being a refuge and a shelter, a protector of his people. So what he's projecting to us by calling him Lord of hosts throughout is this immeasurable sense of strength that he finds in the Lord. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. Verse two, my soul longed and even yearned, or the traditional uh, rendering of that is fainted, which is a strange word, right? We don't often use that word to, I fainted over that. It's strange. My soul longed and even yearned or fainted for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh, which is both parts of a man, right? So with his entire being, he says he sings for joy to the living God. Now, Psalm 84 is generally considered a pilgrimage psalm, a pilgrimage psalm, meaning it's written from the perspective of a traveler, somebody who is somewhere in the land of Israel and is traveling on foot towards Jerusalem, longing to make it to the temple courts. And that's, and that's key to really interpreting and understanding this psalm. This guy is on the way to the temple courts and he's longing to get there, but it's not an easy road. That he's on. And that gets picked up in verses five through seven. And we'll look at that in just a bit. It's not an easy road. But while he's traveling and while he's writing and singing the song, his soul longs to be in Jerusalem. It's like, if you've ever, I, by the way, I hate road trips in cars. I'm too tall. I don't fit in cars well. But if you've ever been on a long road trip and you just want to get to your destination, the, the travel part is a bit of a grind, isn't it? It's uncomfortable. You just want to get there. Well, that's sort of the heart of the psalmist here. He just wants to get there. He wants to get to the house of the Lord, to be with his fellow worshipers. This is his all-consuming passion. He wants to be in the courts of the Lord, to have his breath taken away by the divine transcendence of the temple. But more importantly, he wants to be with the God who's taken up residence there. And that's important to understand. So with his entire being, he sings for joy as he goes along. He sings to the living God, 
who he knows has condescended to dwell in this structure that he is heading for. Now, verse three sounds a little bit strange to us. It almost feels like, I don't understand why he put this in here. But the idea that the psalmist uses in verse three is really very, very beautiful. He says, the bird also, some of your translations may say, even the sparrow has found a home or a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. So why did we end up with birds here, right, Ross? Ross could point these birds out to us after the service if you want. <laughs> Ask me about that later if you, don't, if you don't understand. But you get a sense here, the psalmist is, again, he's traveling to Jerusalem. He's on this difficult road, and he's thinking back to a time when he was in the temple, and he would see these little birds flitting all over the courtyard. And they would fly up into the corners, the highest points of the temple structure, and they would make their nests there, and they would care for their young. And now the psalmist thinks of that image and he envies those birds. These, these simple little creatures that God cares for and loves, he envies them because they are in the house of the Lord and he still has a long way to go. It's really quite a beautiful picture. And he thinks, oh, to be able to make a home in the house of the Lord and to care for a family like that in the courts of my God. Wow. Back in his day, Spurgeon actually, and I read this sermon, he preached a whole sermon just on that verse, verse three. He called it the sparrow and the swallow. And basically what he did was he developed the idea that just like these birds found homes for themselves in the house of God, just as they, they, they built nests for their young, so every Christ follower should do the same thing, to build a nest for himself and for his family in the local church. And it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Birds. Birds, Ross, they can tell us so much. All right, before we go any further, let me, let's talk about Solomon's temple. And I, I'm gonna give you an image. This is just an artist's rendering of what it might've felt like and looked like to be in the courts of the temple of Solomon. Look at that picture, amazing. If you asked any ancient Israelite where the most important place on earth was, this was it. It's a no-brainer for them, right? Nothing could compare to that site. This was the place where the covenant God of Israel had chosen to condescend and to take up residence. And inside that structure, behind those massive ornate doors, think about this now, the creator of the universe manifested his presence through his Shekinah glory. He was right there behind those doors. So in their minds, the temple here on Mount Moriah where Solomon built the temple was the absolute center point of the earth. This was the place in their minds where heaven and earth came together as one. It meant everything to the psalmist to be in this place. Now, the, ancient, uh, the account of, of the building of the ancient temple is recorded in two different places in Scripture. If you ever want to read about it, 1 Kings 5 through 8 and 2 Chronicles 3 and 4. And so we have all this detail about the, about the temple, which helps artists to be able to draw it like this, right? The temple itself was, rec and by the way, don't confuse it with the second temple, which was, which, which was expanded and made much larger by Herod. This is Solomon's temple, okay, built somewhere after the year 1000 BC. But the temple itself was rectangular in shape. It was divided into three parts. You had the courtyard, you had the porch, and then you had the house, and within the house was, of course, two places, the holy place and the most holy place, also known as what? The holy of holies. And the holy of holies, the shape of it was a perfect cube. And that's important to understand. Inside the holy of holies were two cherubim made of olive wood and covered with gold. And beneath the cherubim was placed what? In the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant which David had brought back to Jerusalem and then Solomon had brought up from the city of David up onto the Temple Mount to Mount Moriah with incredible fanfare and with a great prayer of dedication. And it was there over the mercy seat and between those two cherubim in the Holy of Holies that the glory of the Lord would appear. Imagine, the, imagine that. Have you ever tried to do this in your mind or seen pictures of what artists have drawn of what that might have been like to be in the Holy of Holies? Surrounding the house on three sides were all kinds of storage chambers. And alongside the porch were two bronze pillars. And you can see them on the sides there. They were so magnificent in size and so ornate 
that the Bible tells us they actually had names. They were given names. According to 2 Chronicles 3.17, one was called Yakin, which means God establishes, and the other was called Boaz, which refers to the strength of God. So God establishes in strength. So maybe that's a connection to why the psalmist now continually talks about the Lord of hosts or, the, or Yahweh of armies. The picture, being, the picture being painted for us is of might and of power of who Yahweh is. Make sense? Then in the temple courtyard, there was this enormous bronze basement that was called the Yam or the sea, and then 10 smaller bronze basins, each filled with water for a constant purification process And of course, in front of the the porch in the house was the massive bronze altar that they used to actually burn the sacrifices. What what a wild scene, right? It's so hard for us living so many years later to even even fathom what this might've been like. The Bible tells us it took seven years to complete the temple, that 3,600 men functioned as overseers on the project and 150,000 men labored to build it. It was one of the great architectural achievements of the ancient world. 20 stories tall at its pinnacle, every inch of the temple was custom designed, intricate carvings, lavish decorations, the finest linen and embroidery in purple and blue and crimson, colors that weren't easy to get in that day, cedar wood that was imported from Lebanon, hewn stones all throughout, and pure gold absolutely everywhere. Pure gold. In fact, scholars have looked at this and tried to figure out how much. They guess somewhere around 40 tons of gold was put into Solomon's temple for the glory of God. And one of the interesting details that you find about the construction is of all the garden imagery that's used in it. The garden imagery, evoking memories of the first place that God dwelt with man, that God walked with man in the Garden of Eden. Some scholars have gone so far as to say that Solomon built the temple as a garden sanctuary. That's what he had in mind as he was building. The walls were decorated with palm trees and gourds and flowers. Those bronze pillars had pomegranate patterns on them. The lampstands had the appearance of trees with branches going out. Those two great pillars that, by the way, there's no, there's really no functional use to them. Scholars have sort of speculated that it's possible that what they represented were the two trees that were at one one time in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what they represented. So this whole thing was designed as sort of a garden sanctuary. Then he had the two cherubim inside the Holy of Holies, similar to the cherubim who in Genesis 3 were stationed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Right? Even the work that Adam did in the garden to tend it and to keep it has been compared to the duties of the Levitical priests working in the temple. So in many ways, Solomon's temple, where Yahweh dwelt among his people, symbolized Eden and went back to that time to a time when God previously walked with Adam and Eve. There's an amazing thread of consistency that runs all the way through this this idea of God dwelling with his people. And it does remind us of the account in Genesis 1 and 2. Maybe you've thought about this before. Do you guys understand the concept of God being transcendent and imminent? Right? He is both at the same time far away and close. He's up there, but he's down here. Transcendent and imminent. And you think about it in Genesis 1, he's the creator outside of his creation, greater than his creation, transcendent in every way. Yet in Genesis 2, he's walking in the cool of the garden with Adam. That's, that's an amazing thing. Similar to this with Solomon's temple. Yahweh's not confined to a particular city or to a particular building. His throne is in the heavens, right? Far off. He's not, not even the vastness of the universe can contain the transcendence of God. And yet, here he is found manifesting his presence in a particular structure, in a particular location, in a particular city. And he's willing to do that, to condescend to dwell with his people in that way. And we read this in scripture. This is exactly what Yahweh declares. Second Chronicles 7. Look what, look what it says uh, as the Lord comes to his chosen king Solomon. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night. This is after the temple was built and prayed over and dedicated. The Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. 
For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Wow, could you imagine being the king of Israel and hearing God say that to you? Now, there's a few important things to note before we continue on in Psalm 84. First and foremost, we have to be reminded that again, Solomon's temple, as beautiful as it was, was just a building. It's just a building. No matter how lovely, no matter how lavish it was, it was only significant because God manifested his presence there. No God, no importance to the building. True? Because we can't get lost in buildings, right? It's the presence of God that makes it important. Second, we should note that the temple was in part designed to show the Israelites that the only hope that sinful man had to approach a holy God and to receive forgiveness and blessing was by the means that he ordained for us to do so. In other words, we don't get to make up our, the rules. We don't get to say, well, this is how I want to come to God. It's by the means that he ordains. It's by the sacrifices that he commands. It's through the priesthood that he chooses. And it's by the shed blood that he himself prescribes. Apart from God's regulations and God's instructions, sinful man has no hope, right? And why is that important? For obvious reasons. Because all of these things that we read about in Solomon's temple point forward to a future time, a future dispensation, a coming age when all of these things will be fulfilled by God himself in one person, right? The means of forgiveness, the sacrifice, the priesthood, and the blood. All will be found and fulfilled in Christ. But man, what wonderful shadows the psalmist had in this day, right? To be in the temple like that. Okay, let's go back to our psalm. Drop down to verse 10 in our psalm. Here the psalmist picks up the same theme again. His longing to be in the courts of the temple. Here we come back to Matt Redman's song, right? Verse 10, for one day in your courts is better than a thousand outside or a thousand elsewhere. I would rather stand at the threshold or the entrance of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now I could stop and ask you the question, do you agree with that statement? Is one day in the presence of God better than a thousand days at say Disneyland? Oh, it just got personal, didn't it? <laughs> Is one day in the presence of God better than a thousand days at your favorite vacation spot in the world? Now, don't answer that question. Not yet. We'll get to it at the end because I, I want to challenge you with that. But I know those are hard questions, right? To agree with the psalmist here. For now, just take note of his humility. Remember, this is a prominent Levite, a musician, a servant in the temple. Yet he says, you know what? I am totally good with just being a doorkeeper. That's it. I, I don't need much. I'll be a doorkeeper as long as I can be in the house of the Lord. And in our modern world, maybe we call this a, a greeter, right? Or an usher. Hi, ushers. It's an important role, but it's, it's, it's not the same as being the musician on stage, is it? It's a greeter. Someone who is fully content, and in fact, more than that, absolutely filled with joy, joy to just stand at the entrance of the temple and just say to everybody that walks in, good morning and welcome to God's house. That's enough. And you could say that because in contrast, he had in his heart absolutely no appetite or desire to live a life of luxury in the tents of the wicked. That too is a challenging question, isn't it? If you could be given everything that you want, any title, any position, to live in the tents of the wicked, would you take it? The psalmist says, absolutely not. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Spurgeon puts it this way in his sermon. He says, to bear burdens and open doors for the Lord is more honor than to reign among the wicked, to reign among the wicked. Every man has his choice, and this is ours. God's worst is better than the devil's best. And you know what? That's one of the biggest lies that the devil communicates to the world and sometimes whispers in our ears as believers that the Christian life really isn't all that enjoyable. That following Christ is going to hold you back from enjoying the finer things in life and that you'd find more fun and more satisfaction if you just explored a little bit more in the tents of the wicked. 
But the scriptures repeatedly declare that the opposite is true. The true satisfaction and joy in this life can only come, only come from knowing God and abiding with him. And this is a choice, as Spurgeon says, this is a choice every man and every woman has to make. David wrote in Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. In Psalm 36, he said, your children drink their fill from the abundance of your house. You give them to drink the river of your delights. In Psalm 63, your loving kindness is better than life itself. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth offers praises with joyful lips. That's the truth. That's the truth that we need to orient our hearts and minds toward because those verses and so many more in scripture, they don't sound like they come from a man that's being deprived of of fun or pleasure. So here's the challenge. Do you agree with this quote? This is from Matthew Henry, the famous Bible commentator. He says, a life spent in the service of God and communion with him is the most comfortable and pleasant life that one can live in the present world. Do you agree with that? Or more importantly, degree with what Paul says in Philippians 3, I count all things as loss, all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of a few things. No, all things. And count them but rubbish, trash, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. Or even better yet, do you concur with Jesus himself? When Jesus said, look, I came to give my sheep not just life, but life abundant. I came to give you abundant life, far more than anything you'll find in the tents of wickedness. So friends, don't bite on Satan's lie. Decide this day that you would rather be a doorkeeper or a janitor or a plumber or whatever in the house of the Lord rather than a ruler or a celebrity or a millionaire in the tents of the wicked. Amen? Those are hard questions, right? Challenging questions. Okay, I mentioned earlier that Psalm 84 was was written as a pilgrimage psalm from the perspective of a man on journey. Look at verse five now. We're gonna really see more of this in verses five through seven. He says, how blessed is the man whose strength is in you in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Now, there's some alternative translations to that last phrase, but the basic idea is this. How blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord and whose heart is set on, pilgr- on a pilgrimage to Zion, to the, to the house of the Lord, whose heart is set on that? How blessed is that man? So he's drawing a picture of a group of worshipers who are making their way towards Jerusalem. But the key phrase to underline is, whose strength is in you. That's the key phrase. It's not enough just to go to to Jerusalem, right? But the one who finds his strength in the Lord is the one who is blessed. Now, why? Why is the strength needed? Because to get to Jerusalem, you've got to go through something called the Valley of Baca. And that's in verse six. Passing through the Valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. And at first blush, you're like, huh? Huh? (laughs) <laughs> that's super confusing, right? Let me try to explain what's going on. First of all, there is no Valley of Baca anywhere else in the scriptures, and there's absolutely no historical record or geographical record of it. In other words, it doesn't actually exist. What that tells us is the psalmist is using it as a metaphor. Now, in Hebrew, the etymology of that word Baca is closest to the verb for weeping, So what he's doing, if the psalmist intends to use this as a metaphor, what he's talking about is a group of travelers that long to get to Jerusalem to worship in the house of the Lord, but first they gotta go through the valley of tears, the valley of suffering. It's a place that's symbolic of affliction and trials. So there's something bigger going on here. Step back and see if you can catch the backdrop of the poetic language that he's using here. Is that, does does that not describe the life of a worshiper of God? Think about this. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a longing in your heart, a consistent desire to be in his presence. You have the feeling of longing for worship, to be with your church family in the house of the Lord. But then everything gets in the way. All kinds of, life throws all kinds of hindrances and obstacles at you. 
And in certain times and seasons, you got to walk through tears and suffering and affliction. You got to walk through dark valleys, the Valley of Baca. And what do you need in those seasons? You need the strength of the Lord to get through because you won't make it alone. That's the picture he's drawing here. At every step, you need the strength of the Lord of armies to get through this valley. That's why the psalmist says, how blessed is that man whose strength is in the Lord, whose heart is set on getting to the temple in the strength of the Lord, getting to worship. And when we rely upon his strength and not our strength, what he's saying is here, then the valley of Baca becomes a spring, a refreshing spring, not a dark valley. Do you see it? If we trust in his strength and not our own, even that dark valley can become a refreshing spring of divine grace to carry you through. And the result is, verse 7, these travelers go from strength to strength because they're not trusting in themselves. And he's not saying, look, the, the, the train just got easier or the valley's no longer scary. No, it is. But the Lord will carry you through step by step, strength to strength. And look what it says at the end. Every one of them, it says, appears before God in Zion. Catch that now. This is super important. Every single person who is in the grip of Yahweh, who journeys with him through the valleys of this life, will arrive safely to appear before him. What does that sound like? Sounds like salvation. Again, the bigger picture here. Yes, it is describing... This, this smaller picture of these travelers, but it's bigger than that. Guys, this is divine election and perseverance of the saints in the Old Testament. You're in my grip. I will carry you step by step. I am your strength, and every single one of you will get to Zion where you will appear before me. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, okay. I've, you're all just, I can see the wheels cranking here. It's, it's really an amazing passage. Okay, back to the diagram. Let's keep going on this. Let's talk more about biblical theology and the temple. Okay, I'm gonna run through this really quickly to try to get you through the rest of these steps. So you're gonna have to track with me, okay? But stick with me on this. First of all, go back in your mind. Let's go back to Eden. Go back in your mind to the opening chapters of Genesis. How did God create the sanctuary we call Eden? And that's what it is. It's a sanctuary. The garden was a sanctuary for man filled with God's goodness and his presence and his blessing. And it was God's desire to dwell and commune with this, this glorious creation, the highest of all God's creation, the ones made in his image. And the intent was that, he would, that, that God would expand this sanctuary, this, this garden and rule of the earth through man and woman. But then we know what happened, right? Because of the fall... Adam and Eve were evicted from the sanctuary of Eden. No longer could they live in the presence of a holy God. And in that moment, everything changed, right? Leading up to today, sin, decay, and death entered into the created order. But Eden was originally designed as a sanctuary for man. And then God began to, to work out a sovereign plan to make it possible for sinful men and women to be made clean again and to be able to come back into his presence and between Genesis 12 and Exodus 25, we see multiple ways where God begins to implement his sovereign plan to atone for sin. And there are little things that you find throughout. For example, in Genesis, uh, Genesis 12, Abraham builds an altar, a, a mini sanctuary where he can worship God. And he builds it a particular place. In English, we call it Bethel. What does it mean in Hebrew? Beit El the house of God. And so Abraham builds a mini sanctuary and he worships right there in the house of God long before the temple is even in anyone's mind. That's just an example. Later, the Israelites come out of Egypt and the Lord stays with his people. He's, he's a pillar of cloud by day and he's a pillar of fire at night and he guides his people and he assures him that his presence is gonna go before them. He still desires to dwell with his people. Then as they wander through the wilderness toward the land of promise, God takes a more active step towards dwelling with them. He speaks to Moses and he says, let them build for me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And that's where we get to step two, the tabernacle. The Lord gave Moses very instru uh, specific instructions on how this new sanctuary should be laid out and how it should look, filled with meaning, filled with symbolism. 
And they built this tabernacle. And because the people at that time were living in portable tents, God said, well, that's the way I will dwell with my people. I will dwell in a portable tent, just like my people. And it was referred to as the tent of meeting, right? Which was part of this thing we call the wilderness tabernacle. And that holy of holies in the tabernacle became this small little outpost of heaven on earth. Imagine, again, God, big, transcendent, outside of the universe, down into this, this little outpost in this portable tent in the middle of the Negev Desert in the Sinai Peninsula. Amazing. That's how far God was willing to go to be with his people. And of course, later, the Israelites enter into the promised land. They begin to live in fixed dwellings. And that's when God instructs Solomon, yeah, go ahead and build a fixed house for me. Solomon's temple, his magnificent dwelling place. By the way, that temple stood for 400 years, didn't it? That glorious temple stood for 400 years until the 6th century BC when Yahweh abandoned Jerusalem because of the rampant sin of his people. Here's what he said through his prophet Ezekiel. He says, as I live, declares the Lord God, because you have defiled my sanctuary. You have defiled my sanctuary with all of your detestable idols and with all your abominations. Therefore, I will withdraw and my eye will have no pity and I will not spare. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Ezekiel then documents how the glory of the Lord left Solomon's temple. It's a fascinating read. If you've never picked up Ezekiel, do it. Have a commentary with you. It'll help. But he documents how, how the, the, the glory of the Lord, you know, it came up and it, it left the temple before Nebuchadnezzar's army came and destroyed the temple. Now, did that mean that the Lord was done with his people? No, because as Ezekiel is seeing the Lord the glory of the Lord disappear, he says it departed from the threshold above the cherubim and then went out to the east side of the gate, right? The gate on the east side. Well, what's east of the temple? Not just the Mount of Olives, but Babylon, where God's people have been taken into exile. So even in the midst of their detestable sin, God once again was pointing his glory towards his people, the east gate, and so in Ezekiel's prophecy, the Lord says, though I had removed them and though I had scattered them among the nations, listen to this, yet I was a sanctuary for them. Wait, the, the temple was gone and yet God says, I was a sanctuary for them in the nations where they had gone. Even without a grand building, Yahweh remained with his people, continued to be a sanctuary for them to the faithful remnant. And that's important for us today because we don't have a temple, Right? So that's important to know, because what if we sat here today and said, nope, God only appears in, in buildings made by human hands. We'd say, uh-oh, did, did he build this auditorium? We'd have a problem. But we see in the time of the exile that God was still a sanctuary for his people while they were in exile. Now, as we know, after a time of exile, God mercifully brought his people back to the land and a second temple was built, right? Right? But the second temple was nowhere near the size and scope and beauty of Solomon's temple. But more importantly, what was missing? What was missing in the second temple? Two things. The Ark of the Covenant was gone. And secondly, the glory of the Lord never filled the second temple. And it wouldn't be filled until Jesus walked into it. So up until the time of Jesus, the Holy of Holies in the second temple was an absolutely vacant room. So it was that second temple later than Jesus walked into and the glory of the Lord in a, in a veiled way filled that temple. But that's where Jesus taught and where he healed and where he rebuked the religious establishment. And it's that very same structure that Jesus said of in John 2, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, the second temple. And while nobody that day understood what he was talking about in the least, we, we now know what he meant it turns out that both Solomon's temple and Herod's temple were just shadows of a true and greater temple to come. That was hard for the disciples to understand, wasn't it? Because they were so rooted in this, this Israelite history. But Jesus says, no, no, it's all going to go away. 
So in the past, the Lord had manifested his presence in buildings made with human hands, but now his presence had arrived in a much greater form. The living, incarnate, eternal word of God came to earth. You talk about dwelling with your people. The very word of God, God the Son, came and took on human flesh and blood, and according to John 1, 14, he dwelt among us. I mean, of all of these things, it's nice. Eden, wow, fantastic. Tabernacle, great. Temple, the word made flesh. And the literal meaning of that in John 1 and 14 is he tabernacled with us. He tabernacled in the midst of humanity in order to show us who God is. It can't get more direct than that, right? He's the ultimate temple. That's why he's called Emmanuel. God with us, the ultimate temple. And not only that, in Jesus, Yahweh fulfills every aspect of that sacrificial system that was necessary in the first temple and the second temple to atone for sin, all of it. Jesus becomes the ultimate high priest. He becomes the ultimate sacrificial lamb and his flesh, the ultimate veil that was torn from top to bottom in order to give us access, direct access to the throne of grace. But even that's not the end of the story. Right? As they both, but wait, there's more. Because look, we have a bottom row as well. Where is the temple today? Where's the temple on earth today? It's still located in Christ, right? Who sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and it's lived out on earth through his body, the church. That's why it's called his body. We are his hands and feet. It's lived out through us the church. In Ephesians 2, we're told this explicitly. The church is called God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being what? The cornerstone of the building. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into what? A holy temple in the Lord. In whom you, believers, are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. The New Testament church, the body of believers who gather in the name of Jesus, we now constitute the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Congratulations. I mean, imagine the development in this theme from Eden to the wilderness, to the temple, to Jesus, and to us. The story that God, guys, the story that God draws from Genesis to Revelation is mind-blowing. It, it, it just is. And the more you see biblical theology st- strung together like this, the more mind-blowing it gets. It's absolutely amazing. So our lives are now joined with his. We are his physical hands and feet. We are the living organism through which he manifests his kingdom, his life, and his gospel of salvation. And as we do so, his spirit indwells each of us. Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know Hey, church, do you not know that you, plural, all of you believers, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So we are each part of a living, breathing, walking, talking temple. And so we need to be clear that there's no longer any sacred buildings that God resides in. The grand cathedrals in Europe, they're beautiful. Big deal. The biggest mega church auditorium you can find in America, big deal. Big deal. Not even in school auditoriums. He now dwells in us, in his people, both individually and together. And that's where things stand today. As we, as we sit here, as we're all talking about the end times now, we're like, that's where things are today. That's where it's going to stand until Christ returns. And then it gets better. <laughs> That's the cool part. It just gets better and better, right? Because when Jesus returns, he will physically reign on the earth for a thousand years. You talk about dwelling with his people. He will be physically, visibly here in Jerusalem in what we call the millennial kingdom. And he will, he will dwell with his people and he will rule over the nations, rule over the entire world. And as amazing as that sounds, but wait, there's more. Because that's just a thousand years, right? Right? It gets even better. In the book of Revelation, John has a vision of a future day, of a new heaven and a new earth coming together as one. 
And no surprise, it's, des it's described in a very garden-like way. Oh my goodness, wait, you mean it's gonna come all the way back? Yeah, it's gonna come all the way back, full circle. And that's followed by a vision of the eternal heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And when John sees this vision of the new Jerusalem, he says, I saw no temple in it. There's no temple. He says, for the, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And of course that's true. Why would we need a temple? Right? In the eternal state, you no longer need a building for God to reside in because the work of redemption is done at that point. There's no longer any sin. There's no separation between the Lord and his people. There's no need for sacrifice or atonement anymore. But here's what blows my mind. When you look at the description of the new Jerusalem, it has very specific dimensions. It's a cube. It's a perfect cube. Just like the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. Which tells me, and I'm, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, that in the eternal state, the entire new creation is going to be one giant Holy of Holies that we finally get to walk into it. That we're present with Christ in the holy of holies with him. And finally, Yahweh will dwell permanently and forever among his people. And we go full circle. I, I, I would dare say we actually go back to Eden, but even something far greater than that. I mean, I'll take Eden. It sounds pretty good. But this is even better. Okay. That was a lot. <laughs> you guys are so patient with me. I, I so appreciate it. I'm writing last night. <sighs> How do I condense this down? <sighs> okay, I'm going to come back. I, I teased the question, so we have to come back. Is one day in the presence of God really better than a thousand elsewhere? Okay, we're going to be honest now. In our current state, in this fallen world, in these bodies of flesh, with these minds that are still being renewed, our answer to that question right now is probably no. Or our answer might be, I wish that were true. I know it should be true, but I'm not sure it's true. Right? Here's what I want to challenge you with. Trust me, when the day comes that you pass from this life and you graduate into heaven... Your answer to that question will be without a doubt, yes. Unquestionably, yes. In fact, I'll go out on a limb here. When you're in paradise with Jesus, you will say that one day in his presence is better than your entire lifetime on earth. Do you believe me? Because in that day, God will have completed his work in you. You'll be fully sanctified without sin and you will no longer see dimly, but you'll see face to face. And you will know that what the psalmist says here in Psalm 84 is absolutely true. That one day in the presence of God is greater than anything you can imagine. Even a thousand days at Disneyland. So here's the challenge. If that's true, here's the challenge. In the days that you're given on the earth, ask the Lord to start moving your heart and your mind towards that goal right now. Right now, don't wait, right now. Ask him to give you a longing, a longing in your heart to abide with him in prayer. Ask him to give you a yearning that he would be alongside you as you dig deeply into his word. Ask him to give you a sense of fainting for the gathering of the saints in worship on Sundays. To find the greatest joy possible in being in his presence here in this local outpost of God's temple. Because that's what we are. We're a little outpost of God's temple in Stevenson Ranch. Ask God to give you a fainting for it. That it's your greatest desire that if you were far off, say in Canyon Country, <laughs> but you had to get to Stevenson Ranch, your heart would faint for it. Like, I can't wait to be in that local outpost where I can worship with my brothers and sisters at Oak Hill. And I would rather be a simple greeter at that door in the back than be a king among the wicked of this world. Because here, 
in this local outpost of God's temple, you will find joyful worship and you will find abundant life. Here you will find people just like you who are on journeys through the Valley of Baca, suffering, valley, valleys of tears. Here you'll find family that you can count on. Here you'll find care and encouragement and so much more. And that's why we often quote this verse from Hebrews 10, and it's so important. This is why the author of Hebrews fervently says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking or assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you say, the day, the day drawing near. We need to be together. Friends, what you have in Christ is greater than anything the world can offer you. His goodness, his grace, his abundance are unrivaled. So everything else, count it as loss. And I know it's hard to say that right now, but again, get your heart and your mind striving towards that goal to count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing him and abiding with him. And then let me just wrap up simply by reading the last two verses here in Psalm 84, because this is a beautiful summary of, of the psalmist's heart. Look at verses 11 and 12. For the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, is a sun and a shield. In other words, he is a light to our paths and a refuge in times of trouble. A sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing will he hold back from those who walk with him in integrity. O Lord of hosts, Lord of armies, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. That's it at the end of the day, right? Can we say amen to that? Let's bow our heads. Father, uh, so overwhelmed by the beauty of your word, by all the connections in biblical theology, Lord, the way you speak to us through history and through looking into the future and, and, and connecting these dots together and seeing, God, how you have been consistent in the lives of your people. You've consistently desired to dwell with us. And God, there are times when we step back and go, why would you want to dwell with me? And yet you do, Lord. You pursue us and you offer us your son, as an atonement for our sin. And so, Father, we, as a people, as this local outpost of your temple on earth, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice, for his blood shed on that cross so that we can come and we can have fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. It is something we can never repay. We will just stand in awe of you, Lord, and we will praise your name and we will thank you over and over until the day comes that we get to see you face to face. And we long for that day, Lord. But in the meantime, God, as we're down here on earth, will you, will you help each one of us to long and to yearn and to faint to be with you more and more, to be with your people, to sing those praises in the corporate worship gathering. It is a privilege to be in this place this morning. Lord, we know this building isn't anything special, but it's special because we are your people. And so God, help us now to praise your name in spirit and truth. And may you be glorified in this place, we pray. Amen.